understanding jujitsu can occur to you, you know, they talk about shower thoughts and, you know, like later when you're white space, when you're not actually doing the thing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Bulletproof of BJJ podcast. Are you struggling to build your game at BJJ? Here's the thing. You go to class, your coach shows a bunch of techniques, you're in there as much as you can be, but every week you keep showing up and you're like, I don't have a game. I don't know what I do. I come to class, I learn, I do some stuff, and then where am I? And this is actually brought up to me by a friend of the pod who is like, I'm a blue belt going on a purple belt, and I can't tell you what my BJJ game is. Could you give me advice on how to build a game? And that's what we're going to do, folks. We're going to break it down. Um, it was always it a, a dreaded question for me when someone was like, well, what's your game? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I just I might see just what they do, and then I do something back. Jump guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I, I thought about this a bit because uh, when I was teaching, people would ask me a similar question, and I'm not, I don't have the bias of you should try to do jiu-jitsu the way I do it because I think that's not the right approach, me personally. But what we're going to get into is just the, the simplest way to go about uh, your your natural inclinations and building off that because some people are like, I really want to play guard. Cool. Some people are like, I want to, I want to wrestle. I want to take down. Some people don't know. So how are we going to work this out? First things first, you need to pick a position, a guard, a pass, a, a takedown of sorts. You need to pick somewhere on the map to start. Because if your coach isn't giving you specific guidance on how you build your project, which is your project, you're an adult, you've got to work on this shit yourself, um, you've got to choose yourself. So, Joe, yourself, let me, let me throw to you. Holy f***. If you were to just pick a position for yourself right now. Um, what, go ahead. <laughs> no, but I said position, not technique. Whatever, however you say it. But what's something, because a, a while ago you were, you were looking at back attack stuff. Yeah, it was. Um, let's say, let's say back attack. Right, right. Perfect. And for me right now, I'm doing more takedown, wrestle, judo stuffs. So for me, it's uh, kind of throw by, working on the throw by. Right on. This kind of a thing. Once you've picked that thing. You see f***ing Pixley's throw by. Oh God. What's he, he's over the top. He's got the overhook and, and he, he does just, a little and under he just throws with that doesn't he yeah and the rotolos do it too very nice it's yeah i like i've been really enjoying watching pixley's he's a instagram s- stuff he's a savage but human. what i did notice is that he's like towering over everyone he does the techniques on oh yeah he's obviously a tall guy but yes. it's like yeah that shit works when the guy's shorter than you well, i mean i'm not criticizing there but i know i can't do f- throw bys on big dudes very well uh it, i think it is particularly beneficial if you have longer arms yeah. So the Rotolos do it really well as yeah. well. They do this like overhook kind of pull. And if you notice the, the, the grapplers who do have the longer arms are better with the arm drag yeah. point stuff, right? Um, now, you, this might sound a little bit weird because maybe you've never thought about jujitsu in this way. You need to do a SWOT analysis. Oh, wow. Yeah, we're going there. Yeah, corporate <laughs> development day. Take me through it. Okay, guys, so we're going to start with a trust exercise. <laughs> I want you to grab a work colleague. And they're going to fall and you're going to catch them. No. <laughs> Foot sweep. Bam. <laughs> Slam them on the ground. That's trust. No. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What's this look like from a BJJ perspective? Let's, let's break this down. So, Joe, you were saying back position. Yep. And for me, I'm doing more stand-up grapple. Why don't we just choose one? Why don't we just go with yours? You stand-up grapple, take down. No, but uh, but the reason why I wanted... But I want to pl- I want to play. I want to see this SWOT analysis. You want to see how out. this plays out. Yeah. So what is good about the position? Oh, what's the strength of the... Yeah, what's the strength of it, right? And I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the back because it's very easy for people to visualize and understand that. Right? All right, let's go there. Really, the person doesn't have a lot of attacks against you. One of the strongest things about having the back is they're all defense. Yep. Uh, unless you cross your feet. Of course. And then, and then you're in big trouble. So yep. don't do that. But really, the, the, great, the greatest strength I feel about the back is you have massive amount of control, minimal vulnerability. Yep. So you don't have to really worry about defenses if you're working on that. What you do have to worry about really is losing the position. This is like... Probably your biggest problem. Yeah. But generally, people who are good at 
uh, get in the back, keep in the back. You know, they'll they'll body triangle, they'll switch, they'll they'll f around. Like once they're there, you're kind of stuck. Yep. You know, and that's the thing. So the strength of the position is minimal vulnerabilities, maximum attack. Yeah. So then we go weaknesses. What are the weak spots relevant to having the back? Uh, so don't cross your feet because I have seen people, you know, get their knee popped by crossing the feet from the back. Done it's, it myself. We've all been it's my there. favorite way to tap. We've all been guilty of that. Shout out Simon Carson. Um, he, so, but really, so the, the vulnerability is 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 in getting stalled out because also if people are very good at defending from the back, it can get a bit stalematey. Yeah, and you would say that like for someone who's good at defending your back attacks, often the weakness is that you'll end up back with them in your guard. Oh yeah, you like, end up on your back and they're yeah, on top. Yeah. W would that be a fair weakness? Yeah, it is a fair weakness. Yeah. And uh, I, I or think Or you end up in a f***ing half guard or some shit. Yeah, it's, it's it. you go from one of the most dominant positions to, oh, I've got to do this all again. Now they're knee cutting you. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, that can be a problem. Opportunities. So if you're thinking about anything you're doing, whether it's a back attack or anything else, what are the attacks and also what are the transitions? So if you can't strangle your person, if you can't do a back strangle, a choke, an RNC, Mata Leon, what can you do? What are you going to switch to? Are you going to switch to the armbar? Wait, are we still on the SWOT or are we? Yeah, yeah. So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. Okay, okay. So we're going to the opportunities piece. In hell, bro, you're losing me. Shit. Sorry, okay. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, JT's gone. Matrix on this shit. I am. So <laughs> we're, we're on the opportunities piece. Opportunities. You've got the face crush. You've got the strangle. Yeah, you got the transition to the arm bar. Arm bar. you got that nice little shoulder lock that Mikhail taught me. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And you could go to crucifix. Yeah, you got back mounted triangle. There's that too. Re yep. Yeah, reverse triangle stuff. Reverse tri yep, yep. you got transition to mount. You can. Yep. Yep, for sure. Um... Need I say any more? I mean, no. it's pretty clearly the yeah. best position. Or you, just <laughs> <laughs> or you just turn them belly down and just bridge into their lower back and get yep. them to tap from just sheer dominance. Yep. Threats. You know, how can your partner or your opponent mess you up from there? Right. What's... what's Okay, so, this, so say the footlock would come up here again. Potentially. Catch that. Actually, you could get f***ed up on the body triangle. True. Where you body triangle and then they pull that... They all counter over on, on the you foot and, and you yeah, and you pop your own knee. Yeah, I don't like that one. Uh, shout out Chris Dirksen. Um, for any of you who know the name, you know the legend. He armbarred me from the back. Oh, I had my arm over and he was like fighting on this side. And he just flipped my wrist and like oh, armbarred yeah. me over the shoulder. Wow. And I was like, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I was like, did he let me? Because he's two, three belts ahead of me. Did he let me take his back so he could armbar me from the back? Wow. And wrist locks. This is the thing, you know how you might be doing hand fighting and stuff like yeah. that? With the hand that's under the arm there, there is actually a, a cheeky wrist lock if yeah. they fall Particularly to that Particularly in the side. gi, huh? Oh, dude. Yeah. It's, it's actually kind of surprising. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a characteristic of a wrist lock, isn't it? Caught me by <laughs> surprise. <laughs> oh, yeah. snap. I didn't know we were doing those today. This episode is brought to you by Parry Athletics. Parry Athletics make the best no-gi training gear in the world of jiu-jitsu. They've been a show sponsor of ours for some time now. We love them. We love their gear. They make the greatest training shorts, both for in the gym, lifting weights and doing your mobility, as well as being on the mats. You can get 20% off when you use the code BULLETPROOF20 at checkout. Go to parryathletics.com and make sure to use the code Bulletproof 20 to get 20% off. But if you haven't actually thought about the thing you're doing, whether it's a takedown, um, a back control, a back attack, whatever it might be, if you haven't gone through and gone, what's good about this? What sucks about this? What else can I do? And where am I vulnerable? Then you're not really thinking about, you're not thinking the big picture. Oftentimes we just go, yeah, but the knee cut, the knee cut, or, oh, the stack pass. The, yeah, yeah. That these are all good approaches to achieving an outcome, but you got to look at all sides of the all sides of the uh, square so you can better understand where you might get f***ed up. Right, because these are things you got to practice. So if you know that someone might arm lock you or wrist lock you or whatever, you got to you got to tighten that up so that doesn't happen. And so how? Give me, give me the so we so we just did the 
we analyze the the back take or the back mount. Yep. So what would you then? So what would be your next step off that? Based off the based like off the, that. the weaknesses and whatnot and the threats that we identified. So once you've picked your position and then you've done your SWOT analysis of said position, the third thing is actually practicing the individual pieces of the puzzle. Now. I know that there'll be people out there who'll be upset with me for talking about this. And I'm not saying you have to drill, but, you know, be that as it may. If you've never, ever had anybody, you know, do a certain thing to you from a position, you need to practice it to understand what, how the hell that happened. Are you pandering to the non-drilling proponents right now? No, no, no. I'm just saying for our ecological... Have you become a shill? No, I have not. I have not, even though I have met Greg Souders and he's actually a lovely person. I, mean, I love him. Hey, why do you got to bring up Souders every time we're talking about technique? No, because <laughs> no, e because the ecological guys like to get in the in the comment section. He's sitting on his couch right now, he's like, "See that real estate for free in that mother head, baby." No, no, no. <laughs> because the thing is, I met him at the ADCC and he was he was a nice guy. We had a chat. He invited me to train. It's cool. Anyway, shout out. What I would actually propose is that you go and practice each piece of the puzzle. So if you, and you, you, you talked about this, Joe, when you were teaching it. that uh, you Bring me into this, bro. Hey, shut this up, your fool. mess. Go I'm, trying to <laughs> <laughs> I'm dragging you down with me, Joe. That's, if I go down, you go down, brother. That's how it works. It's teamwork. Um, well, this is where I would say to you, because this is my approach. It's not necessarily your approach, Joe, that I would practice little scenarios where the person does try to counter in a certain way and then you work on the counter to the counter. Yep. Or the person does a certain escape and then you work on the transition to the next control. And you do this from a, a fairly passive point of view of just understanding, oh, fuck, how do I get to the mount from the back? How the fuck do I get to the armbar if that doesn't work? Then working that at various levels of resistance and doing that for all the five, six, seven, eight multiple things that can happen to you there. So you're like, oh, all right, I feel pretty good. I understand everything that can go wrong. Not everything, but most things that can go wrong, most things that can go right, and then go put that shit into action in rolling. That's what I would do. How would you approach it, Joe? Yeah, I really like that. I, um, I would definitely aspire to do something like that and have done, it, have found when there's, a, when there's a coach that's teaching me in that way. So like say with Paul, um, Paul Smeebert, shout out, fella. He had very much that approach, hey, we're looking at this at the moment and we'd be looking at this thing for weeks mm -hmm. and it would be like, okay, so let's look at what happens when they counter with this. And, and so we just drill the f*** out of that one day or that week and then the next week, okay, but here's another thing that could happen. And so you're sort of mapping out all of these, all of the potentials, right, as yeah. much as you can. Um, I've always, you know, like I said, yeah. I've always been shit at doing it for myself but when someone's like, Joey, do this, I'm like, that's excellent. And I found that it allows you then to sit on a technique for like ages. Like you can do back control for weeks and weeks and weeks yeah. and just be learning more and more about it. Here's what I find personally is when you're like working on a position and then something ha someone does something to you and you have no idea how to deal with the thing they did, Yeah, that really sucks. Yes. And so even though you may have only drilled it enough like to this degree where it doesn't – you can't counter the counter on every single person. No. At least having a response. So going, oh, what I was trying to do when they did that was that, like you're already so far ahead. Yes. You know, and then, if, yeah, if you can keep drilling that and working on that and implementing it in training, that's going to be a f***ing great little roadmap there for, for dialing in this position. Yeah, and there is a, a, a digestion period. And this is the thing, I actually got this from uh, one of the YouTube uh, channels I follow, which is all about learning. There's this uh, guy, medical doctor, and he's all about helping folks learn medicine faster. And he's talking about reading, and he's saying, just reading isn't good enough. Like, even if you're a speed reader or you listen to audiobooks on triple speed, whatever, he's like, that doesn't matter where that cements is the digestion phase. And the digestion phase happens when you're not directly reading. It's when you're thinking about the ideas that you read. And so I think jujitsu is similar to this is that it, it's probably similar to when I come up with a genius come back to some bullshit you hit me with earlier in the day later in the car and I'm like, oh, <laughs> f f that digestion period is just too slow. Um, <laughs> but calls, calls, podcast. Hey, can we get this in? If I sound by Jack, yeah. can you just edit me and say, Jack, I need you to wake up, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if it's 2am in Virginia, sort it out. Um, 
it's one of those things that understanding jujitsu can occur to you. You know, they talk about shower thoughts and, you know, like later when you're... White space. When you're not actually doing the thing, that it sinks in. And then you go back, you reapply, do it again, rinse, repeat. Yeah. Um, I've had that situation a couple of times recently where I've come to training with some water, but I haven't had any electrolytes and I've finished training and I've had to go to a convenience shop and buy myself some kind of sports drink, usually a Gatorade. Cost me like seven bucks. It's small and it really doesn't contain that much of the good stuff that I'm looking for, which are the electrolytes. Sodi, on the other hand, is my partner when it comes to hydration and I'd simply just run out of it. And it sucks because I got to go buy expensive stuff that doesn't do anywhere near as good a job. I'm super stoked that we've been restocked with the Sodi and now I can be properly hydrated when I train jiu-jitsu. This has always been an underexplored aspect of my training and I'm so stoked that we now have these guys in place to support us and also the listeners of the show. So if you want to be hydrated on the mats so that you can perform at your best and have the best mental clarity while training, get yourself some Sodi. Go to sodi.com.au. That's S-O-D-I-I.com.au. Get yourself some delicious hydration salts and use the code BULLETPROOF15 for 15% off. Go to sodi.com.au. Get yourself hydrated. But relevant to the building your game, one of the hardest things is this. This is the thing I think one of our friends was struggling with is having the discipline to remember applying your game in training. Yeah. You know, because you Not go... Not just getting caught up in the fray. Yeah, oh shit, we're doing f***ing beer and bolos. Guilty. Let's, let's do it, you know. And yeah, sure, like it's... Of course, you go to class, your coach is teaching what they're teaching and that's great. But most of the time, there will be some free rolling of sorts. Most classes, depending on the structure, that's when you got to go, right, i got to work my game plan. Yeah. Like if you don't do that... It doesn't happen. It doesn't mean shit, right? It's all theoretical. It's just, it's just ideas. It's not applied. And I feel the, the best, uh, some of the greatest grapplers of all time, uh, Lucas Lepre being one of them, he never drilled. But what was interesting was he was drilling in sparring. Yeah. Like you would see him working his knee cut relentlessly against every single training partner. Didn't matter how big or small, he was working that same technique over and over again. And obviously one of the greatest grapplers of all time. So he could just do whatever he wanted to people. Sometimes it's not always your choice if you're with Big f***ing Harris. Big, <laughs> big Harris just wants to crush you. You don't have much. Hey, Big Harris, can I just work on my De La Hiva? <laughs> No, no. You know, like you're, you're f***ed, right? But it's your ability to go, no, reset. I'm going to try and implement this each time, each time. I think that is the biggest challenge for anyone trying to build their game in jiu-jitsu it's your ability to stick to your game plan when free rolling comes. So um, if you, with this SWOT analysis piece, um, how, like, do you have some kind of framework you could suggest for how often people should look at this and like how long they should spend? Say they're like, yeah, the back thing sounds cool. How long would they, would they work on that for? I think because for everyone it's different, right? So the analogy I use is like for any of you out there who've, ever played ages of empire just like exploration civilization type game joey glazes over yeah but essentially we all play a real sport the the map is not revealed to you wow so you've got a you're a little dude and you got to walk around and find the resources oh there's the timber there's the gold like mario super mario world or some shit it's just it's just a map you're just a little dude you got a little little village okay and you've got to harvest timber and harvest gold and build resources and build a barracks and all this shit but at the start the map is not revealed to you and as you venture out you're like oh shit there's enemies over there they kill you reset you gotta start again you're like okay enemies are over there we got a big day ahead i'm falling sick let's go (laughs) (laughs) i gotta build a wall there i gotta build a watch post so they don't come kill me right yeah this is like jujitsu when you start out the map is not revealed to you but once you start to learn this position, you learn this map, you're like, oh, there's the, there's the f-ing threats. There's the resources. That'll help me. That won't. And then when you come back to this map over and over again, you already know what the map is. Right. The problem is folks only ever spend a little bit of time on a map and just bleh, die. No, I didn't get that. And then they just change maps, right? It's a new technique every oh, f-ing week. Yeah. So how can you uh, like apply this? It, for some of you out there, you might be like a speedrunner. You might zoom all over the map. You know what the map is in a week. So you only need to do this for a week, maybe. 
I generally recommend that a person spends anywhere from three to four weeks just just on the one thing, knowing the f- out of it. Yeah, yeah, on the one position. As and and ask higher belts. You know, say to them, how do you counter this, or what's the bad thing here? You I'll know, be like, have you ever played Age of Empires? <laughs> Right, and you can nerd out on that. But uh, it's just one of those things. Once you feel you've got a good view of the map, move on. Yeah, okay. Play, play that, a different game. That makes sense. That's, that's my take on it. I'll tell you what I, what I attempted at the beginning of this year, which I've kind of, I started strong, fell off. But um, I, I mapped out like six different projects for Jiu-Jitsu. Oh, nice. And uh, was it six or was it eight? I think it was, who the f- knows? I think it was six. Okay. And I was like, I'm going to do each of these for like, Six weeks or whatever. It's going to be my shit. And back back was one. Mount was one. Back was one. <coughs> Got through those and then coach stopped coaching where I was going. And like, yeah. okay, full. I'm not training at the moment. But um, but that was actually really good. And so I had like a list of like six things that I wanted to address this year. Yep. And I'm pretty confident that I'm going to go back to it. But it kind of laid things. It was very like six things. It's not a lot, right? Yeah. And so it's like whatever. Four weeks, six weeks at each of those. Yeah. Like if I'm kind of diligent about my shit, that should be enough time to get pretty familiar with each position and answer some big questions that I have about each position. Yeah. Um, again, I've proven to myself that I'm just better off when there's a coach coaching me. Of course. You know, but I think that like, yeah, this, this you know, what you put forward here would really fit in well for that, you know, as a way to just to tell you what questions to ask. Yes. So you're like, oh, I want to work on takedowns. All right, well, what do you need to know about that? Well, if you do the SWOT analysis piece, you kind of know like, you don't need to worry about this, but this is what you need to worry about. And it's probably going to be like one or two main things. Yeah. And, and I think that, the, like I said before, the biggest difficulty is kind of sticking to your guns. Because if you're not having success with something, you can get bored. You're like, ah, f- this, I want to just go do something else. But really, the, the, the benefit is kind of staying in it in the sucking and then breaking through the next bit, which is, oh, I, actually, I'm a bit better at this. And then, yeah. and then that can lead you to a different section. Like, that's why for me right now, with like working on wrestling and judo, there's a lot of interplay. Even though they do different shit completely in terms of gripping, balancing and grappling on your feet, it, I feel, is so different to just allowing people have a certain level of control by people pulling guard or passing or engaging in that way. Like the rules are a little bit different. Yeah. So just by keeping the rules around, not pulling guard and trying to stay standing the whole time, that's a constraint that allows me to get better at that. So that's, that's what I'm working on. But yeah, man, that's, that's, that's how I approach it. I'm not saying this is the way. This is just a way if you're not sure. If you're a bit stuck and you're like, can't. I don't have a game. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Pick something. Choose a thing and build out from there. And then it's it's actually not as hard as it sounds other than being able to stick to your guns. Boom, boom. Hey, don't forget, um, if you're still here at this point of the thing, don't forget to give us a five-star review, like, subscribe, do all that shit because it helps to get this show out for other jiu-jitsu folks who maybe don't know about it. We appreciate you. Sure.